Sorrow, I have no pain. But there's one thing that I cling to. You are faithful, Jesus, you're true. When hope is lost, I call you Savior. When pain surrenders, Silence falls, you'll be the song within my heart. In the lone hour of my sorrow, through the darkest night of my soul, you surrender. Sustain me, my defender forevermore. When hope is lost, I call you Savior. When pain surrounds, I call you healer. When silence falls, you'll be the song. to comfort when my heart aches Lord are you there oh, when confusion is all around me and the darkness is my closest friend still I will praise you Jesus praise you
sinner Lost and left to die oh, Raise your head for love is passing by Come to Jesus Come to Jesus Come to Jesus And live Now your burdens lifted and carried far away Your precious blood has washed away the stain So sing to Jesus Sing to Jesus Sing to Jesus And live And like a newborn baby Don't be afraid to crawl Remember when you are, sometimes we fall. So fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, and live. Sometimes the way is lonely, and steep and filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain Then cry to Jesus Cry to Jesus Cry to Jesus And live Oh, and when the love spills over And music fills the night when you can't contain your joy inside Then dance for Jesus Dance for Jesus Dance for Jesus And live And with your final heartbeat Kiss the world Go in peace and laugh on glory's side And fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus And live Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus Fly to Jesus and live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this special occasion to honor and to remember and to celebrate the life of a man who has been so dear to so many, David Pollock. Thank you for being here today. And for those who are viewing this service online, a very warm welcome to you. My name is Marcus Collins, and I am the Senior Pastor for Northcote Baptist Church. And I have the privilege of leading these proceedings today, of giving thanks for David's life. At the commencement of our time together today, we are very mindful of David's family both here and afar, who are coming to terms with his passing. So to David's family, to his parents Cecil and Debbie, his brother Richard and sister-in-law Christina, to his family viewing online in Northern Ireland and Scotland, his aunts and uncles Mavis, Carl, Walter, Eileen, Deirdre and Audrey, and cousins Julian, Tim, Peter, Simon, Susan, Stuart and Ken and their families, we extend to each of you our deepest condolences for the loss that you will be feeling. Please know that you have our love and our support. And our prayer for you is that both now and in the days to come, you will find comfort and peace in the everlasting arms of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. A week ago, none of us anticipated that we would be here in this moment. Life would be unfolding as usual, with many of us connecting with David in all kinds of ways. 
if it were up to us right now, we'd be spending time with David. We'd be talking with him at church or at home group, spending time with him at the pools, at the gym, or at his home. We'd be catching up at a cafe or going out fishing or spending time with him at the beach. Or he would be either helping out with a, with a project or reaching out to someone if they needed help. The reality is that David is loved by each of us here. And it is our love of David that has brought us here today. And so this morning we are here to commemorate a cherished son, a beloved brother, a precious nephew and cousin, a dear friend. And over the next while you will hear tributes and stories that will paint a beautiful mosaic of David's life. Reminding us of his faith, his hope, his love, his kindness, his gentle spirit, and his perseverance. Though we feel a deep heaviness in our hearts and minds, it is recognized that in times like these, we need an anchor to hold on to, for us to be kept in place. And the surest anchor that one can hold on to is Jesus Christ. David's sudden passing leaves an immeasurable void in our hearts, which in turn can cause us to grapple with all kinds of, of questions and emotions. Yet amidst the pain and confusion, we are invited to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For it is in him that we are able to find refuge and strength as the storm of our grief rages around us. The family have given me permission to acknowledge that David took his own life. And while this is not the will of God for him, or for anyone for that matter, we can take comfort in the knowledge that because of God's grace and because of David's faith in Christ, he now dwells with Jesus for all eternity. For as scripture reminds us, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. David is in the abiding presence and embrace of his Lord and Savior. Now, before I take the opportunity to lead us in prayer, I want to offer a personal word concerning David. I met David when I first started coming along to the Northcote Baptist Youth Group, which was around 1990. And he was a really easy person to get to know and become friends with, which I know many of you will have experienced firsthand. From a young age, he always took a genuine interest in the lives of others. I have many wonderful memories of us hanging out, of connecting with youth group, uh, going surfing, church camps, home groups, playing sport. He always had a great sense of humor, and genuinely, he was the nicest guy that you could ever meet. From those years, though, my most endearing memory of David relates to his faith. He took it so seriously, which impacted me as a new convert at that time. His walk with Jesus was so important to him. I remember that he made a personal decision to not partake of communion until he was baptized. This was a strong conviction of his. And I also remember his baptism, which was a great occasion, a wonderful declaration of his faith. Over the years, David and I uh, lost touch. However, in my coming back to NBC just over two years ago, I reached out to him, and our friendship picked up where it left off. And for that, I will always be truly grateful. I am deeply saddened by his passing. And I will miss him very much. But I know that I will see him again. And that is because of Christ. Shortly we'll be sharing in the first of two of our congregational songs for today. The first one being Waymaker. But before we do, would you please join with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father. We come before you with heavy hearts, seeking your comfort and grace in the midst of sorrow. Though we mourn the passing of our dear brother David, 
we know that he is now in your presence, whole and at peace, in the arms of his Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, in which he is experiencing the fullness of your eternal love and rest from all earthly concerns. Lord, we thank you for the time we shared with him, for the gentle spirit he brought into our lives, and for the ways he reflected your light and love to those around him. Father, we take this opportunity to intercede on behalf of David's family and for all loved ones and friends. We pray for your peace, which surpasses all understanding, to encompass, comfort, and sustain each one now and in the days to come. Please provide them with all that is needed, and may they find reassurance in your presence and through the love of those around them. In this time of grief, we know your unfailing love will be our anchor and your spirit will equip us with strength and hope, supporting us as we mourn David's passing. Heavenly Father, we trust in your sovereignty, knowing that you are our refuge and strength in times of need. May your peace reign in our hearts and minds as we navigate this time, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and lift your hearts to God through the song Waymaker. The words will be on screen and in your order of service.
Please be seated. I would now like to invite uh, Richard Pollock, David's brother, to come and share the eulogy for this occasion. And then following Richard, we're going to have Steve Everett, followed by Ricky Burgess, who will come and share some thoughts with us too. So thank you, Richard. Good morning. On behalf of the family, um, I'd like to thank you all for being here with us today. As Mark said, I'm Richard, David's brother, and I'm representing the family, my mum and dad, Cecil and Debbie, whose hearts are broken here today. David was born on the 21st of July, 1975, at Bethany Salvation Army Private Hospital in Napier, next to McLean Park, home of the mighty Hawke's Bay Magpies. Yes, I had a brother, someone I could play and kick a ball with. In fact, the oldest memory I have of, of my life is sitting in the back seat of the car, leaving the hospital with this baby or thing, something in a cot next to me. In 1978, the family moved to Auckland and after renting for a year, soon found a place in Park Ave Birkenhead, which would become the family home for the next 40 years. Even as a child, David valued deep connection. He struck up a bond with a couple of kids in the street. Patrick, Nicholas and David became inseparable and they were always seen together, often getting up to no good. They became known in the street as the Three Musketeers, and the ringleader of mischief would have no doubt been my brother. Mumman recalled on one occasion overhearing the boys chattering, or probably fighting, with one saying, David, why do you always have to be the boss? In those days, David and I were known in Pirate Ave, but for very different reasons. I would return home from school with my bag on my back, shirt tucked in, socks up, hair nicely combed, David would return one shoe missing. Fortunate to have a shirt on his back, let alone tucked in, dragging his bag and his jumper behind him on the ground. It jokingly raised questions as to how we could come from the same parents. David and I played a lot together out the front of the house and in typical brotherly fashion, it was competitive. Not just in winning whatever we were playing, but in getting the other in trouble if a football, cricket ball, or even tennis ball, smash glass or damage something. In 1989, David began attending Westlake Boys High School. There, his passion of the sciences was nourished 
and blossomed. During his time there, he excelled, achieving a distinction in an Australasian maths competition, being selected to represent New Zealand at the National Science Summer School in Canberra, Australia, and winning the North Shore Secondary School's public speaking competition. His desire to investigate and understand how things worked, matched with his compassion for people, led him as an 18-year-old to move to Dunedin to study medicine. We farewelled him one evening with his friends and, in naive big brother fashion, decided to give him a survival kit for university, an alcohol breathalyzer, toy doctor's equipment, and condoms. <laughs> he was embarrassed, and my parents were mortified as I presented this in front of all of the church friends. <laughs> Near the end of his first year in 94, he was struck down twice with glandular fever, which interrupted his studies and exam preparation. This resulted in him just missing out in medical school. He needed an A in his last paper. He got an A minus. He was offered a position in the School of Dentistry but the thought did not appeal, so he decided upon pharmacology. All the stories we have of his time at university paint David as a fun-loving, adventurous, always cracking a joke, a big smile on his face, and even bigger heart. On one occasion, as a poor student, Dad gave him some money, as he was in need, only for Dave to give the whole lot away to someone else who he thought was in greater need. He was also Mr. Popular, life of the party, and would give anything a go, including, for some unknown reason, to walk one of New Zealand's great walks, the Rootburn Track, in the middle of winter with friends, in trainers with no sleeping bag and no food. In 98, after finishing his Bachelor of Pharmacy, he worked as a pharmacist for four years. During this period, though, he was diagnosed with what is commonly known chronic fatigue syndrome. And out of fear of making a mistake with someone's medication, decided to step away from the profession. So he traveled through Canada, the US, and Europe. The most impacting moment for him was being in New York City seven days after the 9-11 terrorist attack on the Twin Towers and seeing the devastation in 2001. As a family, we learned a lot as we uh, of his previous life as we looked through the photos over the last few days. One thing that stood out was this. My brother was a bit of a ladies' man. All through his university pictures and his travels, he had different women on his arm, sometimes multiple. I can actually hear my dad's sister Mavis chuckling in Northern Ireland right now, saying, oh, that Cecil, just like his father. <laughs> He enjoyed his time travelling, and to return home, he began study again, this time qualifying as a teacher, and began work at an ESOL school, and taught himself Spanish along the way. It was through teaching at the school he made some connections that gave him the opportunity to live and work in Colombia. He lived in Medellin for 18 months, teaching English to Colombian pop stars. On his, due to his health, he decided to return to New Zealand in 2007, and before long, applied, was accepted, and then graduated into New Zealand Customs, where he served for two years. I even joked with him, saying, do you realise that you're probably on Interpol's watch list? He was shocked and concerned, and wanted to know why. He said, well, you've got the career, or the job history, of a career criminal. <laughs> you study pharmacy, go off to Colombia, the world's <laughs> biggest drug cartels, and then work for New Zealand Customs? <laughs> That's dodgy. His health continued to deteriorate while at New, while at New Zealand Customs, and he soon di was diagnosed with chronic insomnia. The inability to sleep while the body was fatigued due to both of these ailments became too much for him. Unable to function properly at New Zealand Customs, he resigned and decided to take some personality, IQ and aptitude tests to try and help him identify the kind of work he enjoyed and could do around his broken sleep schedule. 
The testing clinic suggested he might like to apply to Mensa. He was topping their examinations. However, I struggle with that. How could someone who is so accident prone and make decisions impulsively be that? I'd like to give you some, it's just a sample of some of the things. And this is just a sample. Pulling a sewing machine down on his head as a toddler. Getting a marble stuck up his nose. <laughs> Breaking his foot while swimming. Yes, true story. <laughs> Setting his bed on fire. Starting a brush fire in a vacant section next door. Cutting his head while break dancing. Headbutting a fence post. Having to be rescued by helicopter when surfing. Spending two days in hospital, unknown to anyone, after a snowboarding accident, cutting his finger with a chainsaw, and numerous car accidents. One such car accident that comes to mind was his return to Dunedin at the start of his second year. Near the town of Bulls, David was involved in an accident with a very flash and expensive car. The owner stepped out, and it was none other than Sir Bob Jones, the wealthy property tycoon, politician, and amateur New Zealand boxing champion. David had no idea who he was. A heated discussion ensued, in typical David fashion, over fault. And before long, Sir Bob Jones barked at David, do you know who I am? To which David's response was, I don't care who you are, do you know who I am? <laughs> David was fearless and was always willing to tackle things head on. He had an insatiable need to understand things and how things worked, as many of you will have experienced when you have had a conversation with him and found that somewhere along the lines, the conversation has turned and you now feel as if you're being interviewed or at worst, interrogated. In 2009, while living in Onehunga, Dave got more involved in volunteer work. He be became a literacy and numeracy tutor with the Literacy Waitakere, helping migrants and help others build their confidence and basic skills. He also spent time as a guide, wo guide dog walker and blind low vision New Zealand and the German Shepherd Rescue Trust, skills which were helpful to Christina and I when our dog needed caring for. His love for diving, which began at university, over time led to him becoming a qualified diving instructor. So for his 40th birthday in 2015, we had a family holiday together in Fiji, where the highlight for Dave was getting to free dive with bull and tiger sharks, two of the most dangerous in the world. Being in the water is where David experienced the greatest joy and found peace away from things, which is why today we have his diving buoy on his casket, the flag indicating a diver is present. It was during his period living in Onehunga, Dave met and shared his life with Lek, his partner for 13 years, and joined the Thai church. There he was actively involved and was responsible for organising and running youth group events for the teenagers. David's faith was important to him and has been the bedrock upon which he has built and lived his life though not everything has been easy. On moving to Auckland, the family found a church to call home here at Northcote Baptist. He gave his life over to Christ when he was about 12 years of age. It was after listening to a visiting speaker talk about Noah and the ark, how the animals responded to God's voice calling them to safety, and how God is calling us to safety too, if only we would listen and respond before the door is closed. As was often the case asked of us boys on the way home in the car from church, mum and dad asked us to share what we thought of the message and what we got out of it. Dave's response next to me blew my socks off with joy. He shared that he wanted to commit his life to Jesus. He then, several years later, was baptised here at Northcote Baptist on the 18th of April, 1993 publicly declaring the decision that up until then had been private. He loved God and wanted everyone to know it. While enjoying the university lifestyle, 
and questioning life's purpose, given the contrast to the life he had lived and grown up. He had an experience that changed his life. He had a vision in which the veil into the spiritual world was pulled back for a brief moment. And in it, he saw angels and demons fighting over his soul above his body as he lay on his back on his bedroom floor. It led him to connect to the pastor of the Elam Church in Dunedin. And after much wrestling, recommitted his life to Christ. It resulted in him having a zeal for the message of hope he had in Christ to be shared far and wide, and for his friends to take his faith, their faith seriously, as he was now doing. Over the years, his faith became more important to him than anything else. But he was not perfect, and had his questions for God. Throughout his journey to, help, throughout his journey to find help with his struggles, and his lack of understanding of the way God was answering his prayers, his faith and trust in God, God's character and promises remained firm, though at times were very much shaken. David could very much relate to the Psalms written by Israel's King David, when he would write things like, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Do not let the flood waters engulf me. I am worn out crying for help. Yet at the same time, King David would also say, as for me, afflicted and in pain, may your salvation, God, protect me. I praise you. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. The Lord hears the needy. This was the way my brother lived. His need to understand was not satisfied, but at the same time, he trusted in the one who in the fullness of time will make all things known. Even though he didn't understand the answers, he knew God was listening. And as we have just sung this morning, even though I don't see it, you're working. Even though I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. His struggles gave him great empathy for others and created a desire to share the eternal hope he had with others by volunteering in recent times with CAP, Christians Against Poverty, assisting the church here with Alpha courses, which help introduce people to God, and supporting Life Community Kitchens, which provide free meals to those in need. Dave had a great mind from remembering important things about people, as well as things that were important to people that is what drew so many to him and was the reason so many wanted to be a part of his life. His sensitivity and compassion are just two of the reasons why so many of us are here today to remember Dave and the precious time we have spent with him. Dave, you had your struggles and we had our moments as brothers, but I loved you dearly. And as a family, you were our lovable rogue. I'm so proud to be your brother, and I will miss you. But I know we will meet again. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Everett. And I've known David since 1988, uh, about 36 years. And I'd just like to share a few memories um, of our earlier life together as teenagers and young adults. So somewhere between playing rugby for Northcote JB1 team, and there's a photo to prove it, um, and starting to come along to this church here at Northcote uh, and attending Bible study and youth group, David and I struck up a long-standing friendship. The rugby didn't last. However, our common Christian faith underpinned a friendship that has lasted most of our lifetimes. And it's been my longest. So 
excuse me. In the earlier years of getting to know David, Sunday afternoons were a key highlight. We didn't go to the same school or couldn't drive in those days, so our hangout time was usually Sunday afternoon after church. Mr. and Mrs. Pollock, as they were known back then, were always very hospitable, and being invited to Sunday roast that Mrs. Pollock put on was always a treat. One of our highlights as teenagers back in the 80s and the early 90s was fireworks. Whilst now banned, David accumulated quite a collection of double happies and tom thumbs before sales became illegal. I assume his parents knew. Regardless, as his friends, we certainly admired his collection. And then there was the night of the fireworks skirmish with the neighbours, which I will never forget. As Richard mentioned before, Pollock's had a house in Birkenhead. Um, next to their house was a vacant section. I generally, genuinely can't remember who started it, whether it was us or them. However, teen some teenage boys started exchanging sky rockets and Roman candles from one side of the empty section to the other. We had the high ground and the fence, so they never had a chance. Whether it was fun or foolishness or both, I don't know. However, I distinctly remember we all quickly ran inside to watch a video, no Netflix, to watch a video when one of our rockets landed on a new car parked in the neighbor's driveway at the bottom of the hill. One of my funniest memories after the event with David, and I remember us laughing and laughing about it, was around driving. Richard mentioned driving. Here's another story. We had just been surfing. It was extremely wet. David was driving and he was going too fast down a hill and put the brakes on. We skidded straight for a long time, <laughs> hitting nothing but sliding uncontrolled right through an intersection. We both freaked out, but the emotion soon turned to laughter once we realised all was okay. I never drove with him again after that. <laughs> Just kidding. Richard touched a little bit on David and um, him moving to Otago. Um, I missed him so much when he went away to university. However, we organised a road trip to the South Island and um, David sounded like he was having so much fun down in university. I decided to go and work. I was the risk adverse one, the boring one. Um, but we organised this trip to the South Island. I jumped on a plane, took my first trip to the mainland, and this would have been in 1994. David picked me up from the airport in Christchurch. He said that he'd borrowed a car off a mate of his. Anyway, we grabbed the bags and snowboards, and then I saw it. I would have loved to have seen the look on my face back then. I wasn't sure whether to be embarrassed or proud. I was a conservative boy from the North Shore in Auckland, and David presented me with the vehicle that we were to drive around in the South Island. If you can picture this, it was a 1970s Holden Kingswood with Otago colours painted on one side, yellow and blue stripes and then some sort of hand-painted red and black heavy metal symbols on the other side. It didn't look like it should be driven by anyone, and I wasn't sure how it was going to get us around the South Island. Anyway, what resulted in um, was one of my favourite holidays of all time. We tripped around from this house to that. David had organised for us to stay with this family, friends from uni and that family friend from uni. I don't remember where we stayed other than we stayed in Timaru for a couple of nights. Then we went to someone's batch on a beautiful lake that was deserted in the middle of winter. 
There was no Instagram or Facebook to record locations, just memories back then. We, sat, we had some of the best snowboarding in Wanaka and Mount Dobson in my life. It was just fun, pure fun. Life was simpler back then. We had hopes and dreams. We had healthy bodies. And the Kingswood didn't meet a, miss a beat. Even though life changed, our friendship remained. Without fail, whenever we saw each other, Dave would greet me with a big smile and a hug. Like many here, I will miss him dearly until we meet again. Kia ora, everyone. My name's Ricky Burgess. Uh, it's quite strange, actually. I didn't know David that well when I was a young fella because I was hanging with Richard and we were getting up to mischief there. And it's funny how fireworks come up, but I won't tell you that story. Um, but David was always a little brother. But I got to catch up with David probably three, three or four years ago, which was awesome. I heard this name Pollock. Uh, it was actually from the Nortons. Uh, and I thought, I know that guy. Let's, uh, let's catch up. And we, uh, we, we kicked off a really good friendship over that period of time. And he's been a, uh, a special part of who uh, we were uh, over that time. And when asked to talk, I thought, oh, jeepers, that's always a hard one, isn't it? And I've got to follow these two, and they've spoken particularly well. And they said, you get to sum everything up. And I said, thank you. It's a bit like the poison chalice. But I've got three things I want to talk about. Uh, firstly, David at NBC, I want to add some balance then, and then sort of David's heart for God from my experience. Um, David was a networker, my goodness, you've heard about all the stuff he got up to, so I thought better reach out, don't want to miss anything out from Northcote Baptist, you know, we are Baptist, we get uh, offended really easily if someone doesn't say <laughs> that I knew David and he was doing this bit for me, but you've heard about the stuff, his Christians Against Poverty, Alpha, uh, he was always the first to put his hand up in events, the block party, Matariki, there was so much he was always wanting to be involved with. He was actually part of three home groups in this church that I know of. I guess the real question is, why wasn't it my home group? Because he came once and never came back again. <laughs> I'm not sure what that says, because we didn't even make the fourth level of the home groups that David, we probably didn't answer the questions as well as he wanted. But man, he was a connector. He connected with his neighbours, spearfishing, support groups, sheds. You've, you've heard a lot of everything that he did. And I asked our crew, give us some words that explain what you thought of David. And I feel a little nauseated when I say this. But he was described as kind, nurturing, caring, loving. Oh my goodness. Gentle soul, joy, wonder, gentle spirit, warm, gracious, and open. I did feel a little nauseated when I heard this, and this takes me beautifully into my next section, which is adding balance. I would like to throw a couple of my own words into that mix. Uh, I had thought that, you know, funerals are often kind of like you go, you get to church and you suddenly think, did I get to Mother Teresa's funeral? Everything is so nice, and we are blowing sunshine out, this person. And I, they're not the person I know. The nice thing is the two previous speakers have showed that there was a lovable rogue in David. And uh, so don't worry, there's no illusions. This is not Mother Teresa's uh, funeral. The first word I'd like to use is timeliness. From my experience, this was an absolute work on for David. You could chat to him about popping around in the afternoon, and then when he didn't show up for three days later, you realised you forgot to state which afternoon we were actually talking about. Whether it was AM or PM, it didn't really matter. Infuriating when you were waiting to get something to him. But when he got there, it was always worth it, when you had a good chat and a good laugh. 
The second is actually two words, and it's been alluded to, infuriating questions. David was so flippant intelligent. And look, I'm a Northland boy. If it's got more than four letters in the word, I'm probably not that interested. <laughs> and I'm a fairly simple fellow. Put that with David, who was an absolute brain box and researched everything to the nth degree. You can imagine how glazed my look got sometimes. <laughs> and I'll just give you a small example. You're out on the boat and you go, where should we go diving? The topics we covered were as follows. What was the weather like? What was the tidal flow? What was the water temperature? What was the current? What was the water clarity? How salty is the sea? And more importantly, why? Classic. Because when we got to the first spot, what he hadn't asked himself were, do flippers sink when you throw them into the water? He felt that throwing his flippers into the water would make it easy for him to get them on. It is very hard to get flippers on when they're sitting on the bottom in 15 metres of water in weed. You get there, and it doesn't matter what the tide's doing. It doesn't matter what the time of day it is, because when it takes you an hour to find one flipper, the fish have gone away. But all joking aside, David, uh, we're not here to talk about David's flaws, because we all know he was a great bloke and a great friend. Uh, he loved hanging out with people, as we've heard, whether it was your spear fishing, your gardening, going to the Christmas lights. He was always thoughtful, willing to share his experiences. And we've touched on it. He loved Christ. He loved God. Um, his dedication to serving his God was massive, and he showed that not only in how he talked, but what he did. And we've covered a whole lot of stuff there, so I don't need to go on to that and how tough it was for him at times. But man, from a personal point of view, his honesty was amazing. Mate, you could talk about anything with him, and he was honest and he was real. He would talk about the good, he would talk about the bad, and he would talk about the ugly. There's the ugly, and when you've got a face like that, he's the pretty part of that conversation. So you're on a hiding to nothing. Look at him. He was a good-looking bloke. And so what I would love, I know he would love for everyone here to be encouraged and to ask questions. You know, that was what he was. And ask questions specifically about God, because that was his strength, even though he had times where, as Richard has alluded to, he battled. So to wrap it up, you know, I look down here and I see his dive float. And that reminds me, one, that he absolutely loved spearfishing and he was comfortable in the water, probably too comfortable. Um, I have a bit of a laugh because the last time I saw that dive float, a shark was eating the fish off it. <laughs> and David was researching once again what sort of floats you get to get the fish out of the water so he didn't have to deal with sharks. So there's a nice little wrap-up right there. But, yeah, look, we will miss him. Uh, but I think we need to celebrate an awesome life. And I guess thank God that he was in our lives, that he taught us so much about what it was to be human, uh, to battle, and to love God all at the same time. So, thank you. Thank you, Richard and Steve and Ricky for sharing with us. I'd now like to invite Reuben Munn to please come and lead us in prayer. So, thank you, Reuben. Uh, morning, everyone. It's a real privilege for me to be able to lead us in prayer this morning, so let's pray. Father God, we thank you for David. Thank you for his life. You're the author of life, God, and we thank you for the gift of David's life into our lives. We just pause and take a moment to think of conversations that we've had with him. We think of memories, 
all the interactions, Lord Jesus, all the ways in which David was a blessing into our lives. We thank you for the encouragement that he gave to us. We thank you for the ways uh, that he challenged us. We thank you for his inquiring mind, even those frustratingly inquiring questions. We thank you, Lord, for his inquisitive mind. We thank you for the ways that we were able to encourage him and be a blessing to him. Thank you, God, for his heart, for the heart that he had for other people. Thank you for that deep sense of empathy that you gave to him, a love for others, a compassion for others. Thank you for his loyalty, that steady faithfulness that he had in every relationship in his life. I thank you for that, Lord Jesus. We admire that. We appreciate that. Lord God, we thank you for the faith that he had in you. Thank you for that moment, that time that Richard's talked about all those years ago when David heard your voice calling him and he responded to that call. We thank you for that time as a young man that he entrusted his life into your hands, gave his life to you, Jesus. We thank you that you have claimed him as your beloved son. We thank you that the faith that he had in you was the constant throughout his life. And even more than, than his love for you, Lord God, I thank you for the constancy of your love for him. We thank you, Lord God, that you were there at every moment of David's life. And every good day and every bad day, the best of times that he had and the very worst of times that he had, even when he couldn't sense your presence, just as we've sung, you were still there, Father. You were faithful to him. You were present with him every moment of his life. We praise you for that, God. Thank you that your word says there is nothing in this life, neither life nor death, that can separate us from your love. And we thank you that now, even in death, he's not separated from you, God, but we have that assurance, that hope today, that he is with you now, Lord Jesus, in your presence. Thank you, Lord. That's not just a, a vague hope or just a wish, but it is the rock-solid reality that now David is enfolded in your arms. We thank you, God, that he is safe, that he is well, that he's free from all of his suffering and his affliction in mind and body. We thank you that he's experiencing that fullness of joy now in heaven with you. Thank you that as we say goodbye today, we're releasing him into your arms, Jesus, not just into nothingness, but to you, into your arms, into your safe keeping with the knowledge that we will see him again and be reunited for him. And I pray, God, that that would be an anchor for our souls. And so, God, we pray for David's family. And we want to lift up to you Cecil. We pray for Debbie. We pray for Richard. And for Christina. For the wider family too. Each of them on their own journey. We just want to pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would pour out your love, your grace, your favour upon this precious family. God, in the midst of the deep pain and the deep grief and loss that they are feeling, God, we ask that you would pour out your presence, your blessing and an awareness of your love. Your word says that you are the God of all comfort. You comfort us so that we can comfort others. And we pray that you would be the great comforter to this family today and every day. God, that you would sustain them for the journey ahead, that you would strengthen them, Lord God, when the times are really hard, when the loss and the pain seem so great and so acute, would you remind them of your presence? Would you remind them of your faithfulness? Would your peace descend upon them in a new and special way? We pray, Lord God, that you would place your angels around this family and that you would place your people around this family, that each of them would have others who would commit to loving them, journeying with them, walking alongside them on the road ahead. And we pray that you would bring healing into their lives over time, God, that you would bring by your spirit deep healing for the broken hearts that they feel as the days and the months and the years go by, that they would have a greater and greater sense of your peace. So God, you're our refuge and our strength. You're a very, very present help in times of trouble. We pray that your love and your grace and your presence would lift us above the sorrow and the pain that we feel today to see the light and the love of your presence and to take hold of the assurance that David is with you now and will be with you for all eternity. 
We pray these things in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Reuben. We're now going to see a photo slideshow that has been prepared for this occasion. And to accompany this, Nate Hutchison and Charlotte are going to sing the beautiful worship song, Who You Say I Am. So thank you, Nate and Charlotte. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. child of God. Yes, I The second congregational song that has been selected for today 
is the well-known hymn, In Christ Alone, a song that sums up the profound truth that our ultimate hope and salvation lie solely in Jesus Christ. The lyrics also echo the steadfast assurance that in Christ alone, we find our ultimate refuge and strength. And so would you please stand as our team leads us through. Thank you. be seated. The Bible passage that has been chosen by the family for this occasion is 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 7 which says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Within these verses, we find a powerful message of hope, especially poignant as we honor and remember David. In the context of this passage, it was written to believers facing persecution and trials. So there's a sense in which we can take these words to heart, given the loss we are feeling. Therefore, I want to use these moments to have a brief pastoral word with you in light of our reading. As we know, David's journey was not without significant hardship and challenge. The battles he fought mentally, medically, emotionally, in his later years particularly, took his toll on him on ways in which they, we will never fully comprehend. He endured so much in terms of his daily life. David, more than anyone, understood the reality of what he faced, especially with regards to his well-being. He knew what it was to walk through deep, dark valleys, to wrestle with doubts and fears that would threaten to overwhelm him. Despite his struggles, though, David knew that he was born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That his identity was not rooted in his circumstances or in his pain, but in the unshakable truth of his salvation in Christ. We also saw that when battles came his way, David sometimes faced them by himself. At other times, he relied on family and friends to see him through to support him. And when he did, you knew that he was so grateful, even though he would sometimes remark that he didn't want to burden anyone with his problems. Family and friends gave him strength and encouragement and love. Even as we mourn his passing, we find solace in the provision of God's grace and in the inheritance that David now possesses. An inheritance, the Apostle Peter declared, that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for him. Whilst we find it hard to comprehend what has happened, we take heart in the knowledge that God's under, understanding surpasses our own. And according to his great mercy, David is now whole and safe in the everlasting arms of his Lord and Saviour. As we reflect on his life, it's important that we dwell, or not dwell, I should say, not dwell solely on his trials, the trials that he faced, but rather on the courage and faith with which he faced them. Let us remember the moments of joy and laughter shared, the love and kindness extended, the hope and endurance displayed, for in each of these we catch glimpses of God's grace, wondrous grace. And so as we, through this means, commend David to our Heavenly Father, let us hold fast to the promise of resurrection and eternal life, knowing that we will one day meet again in the glorious presence of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Until that day dawns, though, may each of us walk in the footsteps of faith until we too inherit the fullness of of our heavenly inheritance. Each life in this room has in some way been touched by David. Each of you has a personal perspective, a story to tell concerning your relationship with him. I urge you to cherish those stories, those memories. And as the reality of David's passing continues to take hold of our hearts and minds, it is my hope that as you grieve, that you will look to God, that you will lean on him and on those he has placed in your life for comfort. 
And so now we come to the point in the service in sharing in the words of committal. We do this to acknowledge the reality that as humankind, God drew us from the earth. In dying, we return to where we originally came from, but also knowing that it is through Christ that we have the blessing of eternal life. Once the words of committal have been shared, the song, The Blessing, Aotearoa, will be played. At a particular point within it, I will invite the pallbearers to come forward, at which time we would ask for everyone to stand where possible. And as the casket leaves this auditorium today, I would encourage you to follow, the, beh beh to follow behind it, to follow the family. And then when the casket eventually leaves these premises today, you are all invited to join with family and friends in the lighthouse area of our facility for refreshments. And so now the words of committal. As God, our eternal Father, has received David Andrew Pollock unto himself, to the home prepared for him in heaven, we now commit his body to the elements, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and the certainty of their resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we express our thanks to you for David, for the privilege of knowing him and loving him. And we thank you for the way he impacted our lives. We are grateful for your love, Lord. You who sent us the great shepherd of the sheep. You who have prepared a place for all who trust you. You alone are worthy of our faith. To you we turn for continued strength and comfort, perspective and purpose. Jesus, may you continue to enfold each of us with your love. Fill us with your peace and lead us in hope to the end of our days. And this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
children. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you. Amen. 